he was uh, not uh, trying to show off and uh, just to solve problems and help everyone and and this kind of um, uh, you know sense of um, uh, helping the mission making it successful uh, is is something that i remember from playing sports you know that that also is common there. but it's very uh, uh, different from what you find in academia where everyone is trying to bring you down and to dismiss what you're saying and to criticize it because uh, they think it's a zero sum game if you get some recognition it takes away their prospects of being recognized and and um, it's really unfortunate that we have this culture in academia because it also leads uh, a lot of scientists to work on on things that will just demonstrate that they are smart and show off and not necessarily describe reality you know they can work on ideas that have nothing to do with the physical reality as long as they uh, demonstrate that they are smart do, doing some intellectual virtuosity that that uh, is appreciated by their peers and and i think that's really wrong and it's wrong because science is supposed to reflect the interests of the public to be based on common sense you know and uh, if we know that we exist and we n see a lot of earth sun systems uh, you know billions of them in the milky way galaxy it's a matter of common sense to say okay well um let's search for things like us like th this is uh you know not very speculative uh, and uh, on the other hand you know if you just uh, say i want instead to work on you know string theory or uh, supersymmetry ideas that do not have evidence uh, for their existence and and uh, you do that just in order to impress your peers you know you're basically losing the purpose of science which is uh, to reflect the interests of society and and help us figure out the reality that we live in and you know a, a big question is are we alone you know everyone cares about it yeah and i i kind of wondered you you whether it's uh astrophysics uh physics in general even anthropology uh, many different disciplines it seems like ego gets in the way right. of a lot of progress in wrecking uh, it's like the people that are most equipped most educated to be able to do this kind of research to do this type of analysis sometimes won't admit when they come across something that disproves what they may have written books on what they may have spent most of their life teaching um how big of a problem do you think that is or, or am oh, i exaggerating I it's, the, it's a huge problem and you know i'm teaching a class um, that is uh, obligatory to our <laughs> graduate students and uh it's about electromagnetism uh, radiative processes in astrophysics and uh in my, in the first class i asked uh, i asked the class uh, you know what is the strongest force in academia uh, it's definitely not uh, gravity it's not uh, electromagnetism it's uh, jealousy mm. and that comes to your point um and uh, it's really uh frustrating because um you know uh, we we can actually accomplish much more if we remain open-minded and there is this uh, uh, mindset of uh, being dogmatic and saying we can guess the answer in advance we know the answer because it flatters our ego if we base the answer to anomalies that we see uh, you know we base it on what we already know because we have our stature our uh, uh, we, we re are regarded as experts based on what we already know and uh, uh, therefore there is a lot of resistance to gaining new knowledge because in that case it means that as an expert you didn't know something and the people feel that it, it actually hurts their ego so it's not just the success of another person that they are objecting to but also figuring out something that would violate that you know they are the really the, the world experts on a subject and instead what they should think about is you know let's be curious if there is something that is different then it's an opportunity to learn something new you know just like a kid the mindset of a curious kid and and the base the best way to tell the difference between a dogmatist and a curious scientist is to give both of them a lot of data uh, while the uh, scientist would be thrilled you know the genuine scientist uh, that is curious will be thrilled with more data because it allows them to uh, learn something new and and especially if it violates what we already know that would be amazing right you learn something uh, the dogmatist is worried uh, about uh, the, uh, you know that this uh, would go against um, uh, the, the body of knowledge that established their 
uh, uh, stature or, or uh, prestige. And, and that, that is really uh, the, the conflict between the Vatican and, and, and Galileo as an example, you know, but, but it comes into modern life in academia. And, and I think it's really unfortunate. Now, on top of that, uh, the, the fact that the ego gets in the way, there is the question of attending to uh, questions that the public cares about that, are, that matter to society. And again, here again, universities, academia lost uh, uh, their uh, uh, memory of, of serving society. You know, like this was the case during the Manhattan Project. It was the case when, uh, you know, there was work that is in service of society. And um, uh, over the decades, um, even physicists that, you know, gained uh, funding through the, Manhatt the, the, the success of the Manhattan Project, the fact that it physics is useful for the defense of the nation, you know, they forgot about it and started working on esoteric uh, issues that have no implications for technology, no implications for uh, society at large. And, uh, and it's not as if there aren't questions that they can address. They, they just don't find those questions uh, useful to basically show off that they are smart. And, 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 and that's unfortunate. So I think we need to remind those people. And perhaps it's happening now, but this is what I'm trying to do as well. Yeah, I mean, you bring up funding, and I think that's interesting. I was thinking about this as well. For scientists, for people in academia, a big part of the job is seeking funding and getting the, your research funded. Is that skewing the direction, the, like the the places that science is looking, that is choosing to research? Is it is there a bias towards what is most likely to get funded instead of what is most useful to the population at large? No, so the, the problem is that the, the funding agencies like uh, the National Science Foundation or NASA or the Department of Energy, they make decisions about funding based on committees that are populated by uh, traditional thinkers, pe people who are dogmatic, who are, uh, you know, basically giving the awards to their friends that, add, you know, that are in their echo chamber. So you have an echo chamber where people say the same thing and they educate students and postdocs to say the same thing. And that's how you get jobs in, in the job market of academia. But on top of that, the funding agencies are using the same people who are creating these echo chambers to fund their, you know, colleagues within those echo, echo chambers. So if if there is a challenging idea, something new, they would not fund it because it will shake the foundation of the echo chamber. And so that's the core issue that in order to foster innovation, you really need uh, to fund the risky projects, projects that are not within the box of what... And of course, you have all these people who are trying to keep the herd tight, you know, and uh, do not allow others to deviate from the beaten path and they say we should go along this beaten path. But if you look at the history of mainstream physics, for example, uh, there was a very popular idea of supersymmetry that everyone believed in since the time I was uh, I started uh, doing physics. And, and uh, it, people were confident that this new symmetry of nature exists and therefore we can even build on it. S uh, string theory was built on, on, on that foundation. And then we went to test it with the Large Hadron Collider at a cost of $10 billion. And we haven't found it in the natural range of parameters. Now, I have no issue with the fact that we haven't found it because, you know, sometimes you go into a dark alley, you, you don't know what you might find. And you, 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 but the, the problem is if you put uh, uh, the herd in a very tight configuration along a single path and you don't find anything, then you lost a lot of time, a lot of resources uh, and and it's a much better approach to diversify your portfolio to have multiple paths and uh, to have critical paths uh, people with original ideas are, are that are being funded and in the context of the search for life what i'm saying is instead of just going all along the path of searching for microbes you know they might be very common but they are difficult to find let's just uh, invest similar funds in a different path which is currently not funded at all uh, federally, uh, because all the people on the on the you know committees keep uh, arguing that we should do what what their colleagues are saying we should do, which is this echo chamber of look, looking for microbes because they are common, but they don't realize that it's challenging to find them, and maybe it's easier to find uh, signs of intelligence, technological signatures, 
we just need to invest in that uh, the same amount of money because we want to hedge our bets. So the mistake being made is uh, that uh, there is no diversity of uh, multiple paths, multiple opinions for discovery. There should be more risk-taking projects that, uh, I mean, people in the com uh, commercial sector, in the industries, they recognize that, you know, you have think tanks, the uh, mm -hmm. blue sky research within the big corporations like Google and, um, you know, Facebook and so forth. And, and they think broadly, but within academia, you don't, find it as much and and that is really troubling because uh, academia is all about uh, blue sky research you know it's um the the whole idea of tenure was to allow people job security that uh, uh, prevents them from being chained to traditional ideas so they can explore uh new ideas and unfortunately they don't do it because of this peer pressure and uh, i can witness that uh, myself when i'm trying to say something different i'm being attacked very often personally and uh it's really unfortunate yeah i, I think this is just another example of why for so many people there's failing trust in institutions uh you know the scientific community is an institution academia is an institution and like many other institutions to include the military for that matter which used to be kind of the gold standard of where trust always was uh you know it's just uh, for a lot of people they're they're giving up on the idea that they can trust these institutions um well but in, in the context of science i just wanted to mention one thing that the approach taken for conversing with the public was also misguided because the idea was we will figure out the answer through experiments in in, in physics let's say and then uh, make a press uh, conference in which we tell the public the answer and, you know, the public feels like students in a class, like the, the scientists are lecturing the public what they should know. And it's a one way street. They are not asking for critical uh, remarks, uh, you know, idea, uh, challenging ideas. They just tell the public uh, with a sense of superiority. And I think that's misguided. And based on my experience, you know, when I went to the Pacific Ocean, I wrote a diary of what we are finding and how we're, I'm thinking about it. And there were millions of people that followed it. Uh, right now, when I write my essays, there are you know, more than a million people every month that read my essays on medium.com. And the way I approach it is to be honest that you know, science is a learning experience and we might be misguided, we have the wrong ideas. But as, we, as time goes on, we get more data, more evidence, just like a detective story. And uh, you know, we, we keep shaping the way we think about the problem by having more data. And, and the public loves it because then, you know, there is no sense of superiority. You, you're engaging the public and anyone within the public could have become a scientist. You know, I, I got an email from a, a former Air Force uh, pilot uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, and the title of the email was um, Because of You. And he said, uh, because of you, he referred to me. Uh, he said, my daughter now wants to become a scientist. She heard you on television and uh, she keeps talking about aliens. And, and uh, you know, that's the biggest compliment that I can get. If, if mm -hmm. a young kid, and, and I heard it from a number, including a reporter from uh, the London Times that told me that he read his own story that he wrote about my work to his kids and now they want to become scientists. It's simply because, you know, you can see the, the human aspect of, you know, being uh, vulnerable to, to you, know, you, you don't know much, you, you're ignorant about how to solve this, but you're, uh, you're open-minded and then you collect data, evidence, and, and, and that guides you. And, and it, it sounds familiar, you know, that's the way we figure out things and, and it's fun. And for some reason, the scientific community lost the this approach and communicates with the public in a very different way and and the science looks sterile that way because the public is not engaged in the process so i think that's another way of uh, that that there was a mistake made and it's the way of communicating with the public i i do it in a way that you know just i can definitely make mistakes i, I may be wrong but i'm completely honest and sincere about what I say, that's the way I think about it right now. That's the way, you know, I, I imagine it to, to be, but then we get data and we will find out what the truth is. I, I think that 
the interest in science and particularly your field is at an all time high right now because of the willingness of you and uh, some of your other colleagues, as well as other what I would call celebrity scientists like Neil deGrasse Tyson or uh, even Carl Sagan. Um, I'm not a scientist myself, so I don't want to opine. I'm sure you have an opinion there. I. But what I will say is that there are many uh, people that are like you that being on this podcast right now that are saying, hey, we need to go talk about what we're doing with the general public. This can't it's not good for business, right? Like right. It's not good for exactly. the field to say yeah. the only people that will ever be exposed to my knowledge, you know, you is somebody that can afford the uh the the privilege of going to an institution like Harvard University or one of the other Ivy League. 